It's, hi there well I, I mean maybe i could do the first bit and then i could leave you i could do the first i'm a bit tired i could do the first 10 minutes or so with jim we'll talk about our giant stuff <laughs> yeah it's can, nice to I see can, you I can, I can duck out quietly <laughs> you know is it, would that be yeah cool? yeah whatever word that because i can't do another hour uh, i'm a bit Good night, Robert. Good, Good night. With with uh, with JJ in the background there, and you guys closer <laughs> to the computer. If you could it, dance it, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> it, looks, it, looks, it looks like you guys are giants, and, and JJ is just a regular sized person. Oh, no. It's too much. <laughs> We're silly. <laughs> I like the fun. This is, you guys are fun to hang out with. <laughs> oh, some insanity. Uh, nice to see you, Robert. Oh, well, let me just get a drink quickly. Yep. Uh, I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, drink. nice to meet you, Jim. No, thank you. Nice to meet you. Well, um, uh, while we're waiting for um, Hugh to come back, uh, why don't yep. I introduce you a little bit? Uh, as I understand it, you're a stonemason, and that by itself fascinates me. How did you get into stonemasonry? And by the way, welcome. I'm, I want to introduce everybody to, to James Vieira. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for having me. Um, I went to UMass uh, along with my brother and we studied economics and um, it just wasn't my gig. I really uh, was restless and anxious to, to find something creative and to work outdoors. And I just fell backwards into stonemasonry about 30 years ago. And um, we live in a place in Western Massachusetts where there's some really uh, world-class quarries and there's uh, colonial stone walls everywhere. So we rebuild them on our road and do all kinds of uh, stone art, stone towers and fountains and arches. And yeah, just it's in my wheelhouse and I, it's, um, it's a good profession for me because it keep, keeps me like physically and mentally set you know, and then I could do other weird stuff like hang out with you and research giants, you know? <laughs> nice. Well, uh, this, this may be some fascinating thing that most people aren't aware of, but I think you might be. Um, yep. Do you know the, uh, store, the, the marble stone quarries of, um, of uh, Carrara in Italy, the Carrara stone marble field? Isn't that down in Sicily? No, that's up by uh, Cinque Terre and uh, uh, Marmor de Forte. No, I don't um, know that. I'm not sure about that, no. What, what's yeah. the um, intrigue about them? Oh, well, they're still, they're still quarrying marble there. There's this huge mountain. I went and hung out there because I was in, into mosaics. And I got an invitation to come and hang out there. In, in, uh, not Cinque Terre, but... Um, uh oh it's right on the tip of my tongue michelangelo had a studio there in um oh it means holy stone in in italian uh um, I, I don't know that one no i'm not I'm actually not uh, sure uh i i almost had <laughs> it'll, it'll <come> up <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 right on the coast and um it's you have the Mediterranean 15 minutes away, and then you have the Italian Alps 15 minutes right, away. Right, right, gotcha. and it's just yeah. a, a a cool place to hang out. Anyways, Michelangelo's studio is still going there from uh, you know four or five hundred years ago. Wow! And um, sculptors come from all over the world just to cut that specific Carrara stone. Nice. Mm. Yeah. yeah, being a mason it helps gives me a unique insight into all these megalithic sites. And we just did a tour with Yusef Awan, who's a um, he's an Egyptian stone sculptor, and he was brilliant on the tour. My first time with him, and uh, it, it is good to have that insight because one of the um, 
the ways that archaeologists get annoyed when somebody interlopes into their field and tries to tell them what's going on. Whereas I see that happening uh, with all the stone masonry around the planet where I would say it's impossible with the tools of the time attributed to uh, the making of these monuments. And you really don't have much pushback in the archaeological community. There's all this like vague notion of uh, armies of men and, and a lot of time, but that's irrelevant. You know, you need uh, tools and, and um, technology, I would guess, uh, for lack of a better word, word, word uh, to build all these structures. So I, I find it like really interesting that a multidisciplinary approach is not, um, you know, put to the test at all these sites. It's more like a narrow focus of, you know, dated pottery shards or whatever. So we both kind of share that idea that there's a lot of lost technology around the planet. How did you guys meet, and um, what's the crossover and the overlap from your your individual disciplines? Sure, we met we met at the um, actually I put on a conference in um, uh, Glastonbury, Connecticut, back in two thousand eleven, uh, a megalithomania conference. We had Freddie Silver there actually, um, nice. and Jim turned up, uh, and we kind of met, I met Jim there, and he was doing all this weird giant research <laughs> and these megaliths of New England and other such things. And uh, yeah, we realized that I've been kind of studying it from my own perspective. Uh, again, this is another David Hatcher children's story. Uh, I was staying <laughs> at his place in 2008 and Ross Hamilton's A Tradition of Giants literally almost fell off the shelf in front of me. So I read the whole thing and it blew my mind. And that's what got me into the American side of the giant story. So then met him a few years later at this conference and like we realized he'd got he'd done all this data. He started doing this daily giant kind of blog post for like a year and a half. You know, all these accounts and it's like, what the hell? And uh combined with Ross's stuff and the American megaliths in New England I've been looking into for a decade or so, we decided like we should you know, put put our heads together and get a book out because I've got a lot of stuff he hasn't got. He's got all the accounts we can work with, all the the, uh, the awareness of the landscape and so forth. So yeah, it was uh, really a collaboration. And now now we're doing the British book. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be overly metaphysical, but it just seems like these things are in your wheelhouse as part of your script, if you will, your karma. And we just fell into it. I, I couldn't couldn't have not done this. You know, I couldn't have predicted it when I was thirteen years old, but. Now I can just see they're just drawn magnetically into this um, weird and kind of fascinating subject. I just feel like it's that, like it's, it's part of your script, for lack of a better word. Is there any fascinating story that you guys have come across together that just outdoes any of the other stories? Fascinating. God, there's a bunch. <laughs> uh, I know. Does anything specific stand out? Like, for example, the, the giant thing, overcrosses it seems like universally well i think i think the thing that kind of uh blew my mind with well, this giants thing blew my mind when i found out about it and started researching it especially his daily giant thing which i was kind of following for you know the whole time it was there um is that, that there's a whole just chapter of like human history completely eradicated deliberately i believe from the historical record and it's all there and like so you know we, we thought maybe north america there'd be a few more accounts we find a few more we ended up what over a thousand maybe one and a half thousand um accounts with a bunch of researchers working on it not just us um and that really stunned me and like you know then, it, then I, we started applying it to britain it's, it's blown my mind even more and the stuff we're finding we, we, we we're finding that a lot of it you can't find in you know you can, you're not going to find it online, basically, unless you're looking into old academic journals. You've got to translate some of them. You've got to do this just to kind of get the old English or the Welsh. Um, or even though, you know, even though in America, it's the same. I mean, unless everything's been digitized, you're going to have to go to libraries and look through microfilm to find, you know, what you're looking for. Yeah, and I, I like to put things in context and, and talk about human psychology in these arenas, uh, politics, religion, ancient mysteries. You have true believers who can sometimes have an over willingness to believe and get sucked into all those like clickbait nonsense on the internet. And then you have pseudo skeptics who aren't skeptics at all. They're, they're like hardcore debunkers and their brains don't make enough dopamine and they kind of live off of, of trying to denigrate other people. And, and it's, a, <laughs> it's just like politics and religion, you know, it's yeah. really the same orientation. <laughs> But I don't, the analogy to me is like when I go to the doctor, 
I'm just like waiting for some awful diagnosis. And if it comes, the treatment is even more awful than the diagnosis, where in fact, I go to like an Ayurvedic practitioner and it's a holistic approach. She, she does like astrological readings and it's just like, oh yeah, this, this is your past life karma and things like that. And it just, it's a holistic approach. And science and academia works like a, an atheistic cult. And I'm not, I have friends who are academics. It's very important to have that discipline. You do a dig, just like if I broke my bone, I'm not going to take a homeopathic remedy. It's, it's important to have that approach. But there's a non-holistic orientation in all the sciences, whether it's medicine or archaeology, anthropology, geology. And I find that oral tradition gets pushed out of the way. The, mystic, the mystics, um, the, the wisdom keepers, like Pythagoras and the old scientists, they were they were healers and, and sages and prophets. They weren't like in the lab all day. So that orientation, I think, addresses this idea of like a mass conspiracy. I think it's just, it's, it's basically, um, it's a dogmatic way of looking at things. And as we see from the Clovis Bear and all these other um, ideas of science that were proven wrong after 70 or 80 years, the human ego just digs in and is riddled with agenda and doesn't want to get out of its comfort zone. And that is how we explain things like we study, because it's all there on the historical record. Forget about myth and legend, which is everywhere, including like isolated Pacific Islands. Basically, it's all in the academic record and the historical record, you know, buried obscurely in town and county histories. It's not front page news. And then I look at a sort of skeptic take on it. And it's like an eighth grader trying to debunk it instead of saying, wow, this is interesting. It's very telling about somebody's psychological state. So I like to, <laughs> not to shit on anyone, but, you know, I like to discuss these dynamics that are going on because we catch a lot of heat for just, like, uh, reciting historical documents. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing how, how you can wind people up with giants. It's, 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 it's remarkable. I mean, we did, there was this show, Search for Lost Giants, Jim and Bill Vieira were in it, maybe. Yeah. I was in it a bit as well. And they had, you know, after that, a whole team of skeptics decided to create blogs to try and put down so this is all false you're rubbish you don't know what you're talking <laughs> and it went on for ages now he's best friends with one of them which is even weirder <laughs> and um you know the fact is you've got you know it, it riles people because you know we're not like we don't, we don't claim to be academics or science scientists i mean we've got our own degrees and certain things we've done our own studies and other things but you know we're coming at it just from a kind of you know almost like an antiquarian kind of uh, passion for it it's our, it's our life we want to do it this is what we're going to do even if we don't have you know got any money coming in we'll still do this this is our thing and so um you know and it enables you to not be blinkered by what is expected if you're an academic or yeah. if you've got a certain uh, a route of training you've taken and so yeah i think it's uh, a delightful to be independent and kind of free from that and you can just do what you want but you get attacked for it though you know we, we, we we're not making big claims about giants we're just like presenting tons of evidence and documents and academic journals that are, are saying here he's a nine foot giant we dug it up you know in a scientific report yeah but still you know I'd say that you know, we have the same orientation and we're both like academically oriented, frankly, we, we read through stuff, data driven, but we believe there is truth and myth and legend and, and oral tradition and a scientist just doesn't at all complete fantasy. So that's where we differ. So there's really not a lot of, um, you know, differences. We, you know, I, I use a lot of academic material and I cite a lot of academic journals and papers in my research because I can always count on them getting the facts right, which I appreciate. It's really, uh, it's a meticulous uh, endeavor, but the, where the uh, interpretation goes after that, I don't always agree with, it's, you know, not in a confrontational way, just like the interpretation I think is, is something more bizarre and supernatural than maybe the academics think. But the moral of the story is that, you know, we're, we're not different at all. I think it's just, uh, we rightly attribute reality to myth, legend, and um, an oral tradition. And I do a lot of ceremonies with like indigenous healers and stuff, and they all tell me the same bizarre things about the nature of reality. And you can see the integrity, you know, know it by heart. That's like, you know, 
knowing it from a, a, a larger place and, and remembering, you know, like the Druids would practice this memory technique for like 20, 25 years. That's knowing it by heart. That's not just reciting some crap, you know, um, off the top of your head. <laughs> wow, I, I, I love that saying. I, I used to say that when I was a kid, people would ask me, how did you learn how to ride your skateboard? How did you learn how to do this? I, I just say, uh, know it by heart or, you know, do it by heart. Yeah. Um, I just repeat that. I didn't know what I was talking about. I, I, I was just, it's like when you get, you know, when you try a new sport, you get the hang of it. Yeah. Then you know it by heart. You don't, you don't have to look at any books or anything. You just know it. And, and that's an important aspect of all this. It's intuition. You get guided when you don't have, when you're not um, confined by dogmatic orientations. And, and I just know like every academic I know, God bless them they're more afraid of ayahuasca than Atlantis. You know, it's just like they, they're just stuck in this, um, this mind, this jailed atheistic cult. It, it's just crazy, you know, and I could see him wanting to break out and say, fuck it, you know, but it's like, oh shit, I got to pay my bills. And you know, it's just, what, what are my peers going to think? You know, that kind of thing. Well, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> but, but that it, it's so liberating to be guided by intuition and to not be, um, you know, uh, pushed in a direction by consensus blindness or, um, you know, th these things that are just false constructs. It's really ref uh, refreshing to be just guided uh, intuitively. That's, that's refreshing to hear that from other people too, because actually the, the scientists are limited because they don't have other overlapping disciplines that they could use comparative studies with. Um, where we're not limited to using their material uh, and including them. Uh, there's no reason to exclude them. I mean, everyone, everyone to be on board is more help. So, yeah. That's a great point because I use a lot of academic material and it's like, okay, let's see what the, astro uh, the astronomers say about the site. Let's look at the construction techniques. Let's look at the oral traditions. Let's look at the burial reports. And, you know, talk about uninspiring. I hate to say like a lot of archaeological um, interpretations of sites are kind of like it's never the spiritual aspects of the people it's never um something larger it's always kind of a mundane just like when you go to the doctors you know it's uninspiring it's just like take this pill you know it's never like you need to meditate you know you should no. drink wheatgrass you know uh you should go to therapy whatever it's always like yeah you know take this pill. Big, yeah <laughs> there's a there's a big thing in britain with the um stone circle stonehenge and so forth where they kind of just they kind of just label them as you know anything made of stone is a, a site of the dead you know the ancestors anything made of wood is a site of the living and that's about as exciting as it gets you know it's like there's not much more than that they talk about these ceremonies people coming down from scotland they, they do draw some fascinating conclusions don't get me wrong but we were speaking in the previous interview. I was just there, there is this aspect to it, you know, that these are kind of the temples, and they're like designed to and do things to you, and like you you interact with that. There's an energy there, it, even just the shape of it, uh, the material, the type of stone, and just the the location geodetically. Just those three things can create this remarkable space that can affect you and it can affect you for thousands of you know generation after generation and so there's something to be said about that and you're not going to get that that aspect you know addressed you know uh, you know and even on you know yeah. general kind of you know standard tv you don't get shows that you would even talk about this kind of thing very vaguely i mean there's there's one thing yeah. that came out i think about 10 years ago timothy darvel an archaeologist was kind of a kind of updating the, the stories of Merlin in the Preseli Mountains where the blue stone that was used in Stonehenge, you know, 120 miles from it in Wales, they used to pour water on it and in the tradition that, you know, it was linked with Merlin, it was linked with like healing waters, people think they were going to get better. And they actually started, so some archaeologists do bring in this aspect based upon mythology and old texts like the history of the kings of Britain and actually bring and do start to bring it alive. But this is kind of stuff that's been talked about for previously 10 or 20 years before that by the alternative people so you know the researchers so i think you gotta like um you know there, there's a lot of catch up from you know both sides really yeah I'll, I'll jump in and say um 
that these ancient sites are tools of enlightenment, no question about it in my mind. And I know Freddie Silva's in the Yucatan right now doing one of, we, we kind of share the same <clears throat> um, ideas about these sites as him. It, it's like they were originally to sacrifice the separate self, uh, greed, jealousy, hatred, anger. Wow. Some obviously devolved, and that's what Edgar Casey, the mystic, said uh, about, um, about that. And then they devolved, of course, into the Aztec sacrifice and thing like uh, things like that. But the point is that, you know, here at Stonehenge, this whole grid is laid out um, in a way that it's enchantment of the landscape. It, it raises your vibration. It's uh, it brings a benevolence to the to the people who live here, just like the the Great Chamber uh, in Egypt, to the, in Giza. We were just there a couple months ago, and it's just like turns you inside out. It's built specifically with geometry, mathematics, stone choice, all of this wisdom that goes into it, basically to um, shift your consciousness. And that's why it's so important to go to these ancient sites. It's not like, oh, that's really interesting. And talk about, it is really like soul crushingly boring to listen to another tour guide at these sites. <laughs> oh, they built this in 1500 AD and, you know, and, and we think the function was ceremonial. There's none of that like spiritual enlightened aspect of it. And that's why, you know, this would be just another interesting story for me anyways, right. if there weren't a metaphysical conclusion, that's what I find. Yeah. Yeah. That that's exactly what Martin Gray is saying too, after he's traveled to more than 1500 of them in 165 countries, that's, that's his whole theory behind it is, this is to tune us up. This is to make us better human beings. And uh, what's the point of studying all this a ancient culture and everything? If it isn't good for us today, if it's, if it doesn't benefit us today, what's the point, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've got, I've got to just um, <laughs> credit John Michel. Oh, yeah. Because anyone who's interested in this kind of yeah. principle, he kind of came up with this wonderful kind of, kind of philosophy really in the late 60s early 70s he, he founded the megalithomania conference with us he was uh, he was like my kind of you know author hero kind of thing um and and he was convinced of all this and he started you know he was studying the kind of geometry in the temples in jerusalem and other such things finding this ancient number system and measurement system which he redefined the whole story of ancient metrology, ancient measurement systems, which now is being continued by John Neal and more recently Adam Tetlow. And these are just individuals, kind of like, you know, even though he was quite well educated, John Michelle, he, you know, he was at Cambridge and Eton and so forth. Um, it's really the alternative research to, uh, we're kind of making sure it maintains itself into the modern age. And there's this, this whole system that's being held together by about three people, you know, of this ancient measurement. And no one else realizes that's what's actually there. So you get things like this going on that people don't even realize. And, um, and he, he really coined the whole kind of idea of the, what we were talking about earlier, this kind of field of energy across landscapes connecting these sites. And it's become like, a lot of us believe that now, but it's actually John Michel who kind of put that in place and kind of brought that out into the open as a reality. And he kind of proved it based upon the geometry, the ley lines, the earth energies. More recently, the study of archaeoacoustics, where there's a whole kind of uh, audio version happening within these sites, which affects us as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like the hypogeum in Malta, acoustics, light and sound, more the more dimensions involved the the greater the effect and that was an edgar casey thing as well the light and sound but like the hypogeum in malta and so many sites are uh basically built for the acoustics you know how i'm sure you've done drumming ceremonies and things like that and and how you get like into a multi-dimensional trance state that's exactly what's going on it's like psychedelics we use sometimes it's like how do you get out of over identifying with your movie your temporary movie character you know what i mean that is the goal and it's like you do it through ritual you do it through all these things we're talking about people do with like i said with ceremonies and ayahuasca as well or, or massive meditation but that's where the rubber meets the road then you're like oh oh then i i can see with clarity you know you look like somebody you know has been struck with that vision at times in your life where you kind of go to the finish line or step out of your body and you see what's really going on. And then you reorient back into your kind of matrix self, but to step out 
that's the goal, the experience, because intellectual understanding only goes so far. Like I'm a non-dualist, so I study like the Course in Miracles, and it's all geared towards an experience of what you really are, not what the separate self is telling you you are. And that's what these ancient sites can really drive home if used correctly. Wow, I, I, I really appreciate that aspect from both of you guys because, you know, some people just looking at the numbers, looking at the dates, uh, okay, you know, I, I would be interested in anyways just out of curiosity. Yeah. But where's all the curiosity supposed to be leading us to? That, that's what I'm really into it for. And I think the metaphysics uh, undisputedly can't be um separated though some people try to take it away from that i think that just totally ruins um why people put so much time and effort and energy into and like some kind of over-the-top technology they were in another paradigm that we just don't understand it answers the question i'm just reading uriel's machine right now um I stole from Hugh, and it's the same thing. It's like this massive effort is going is being undertaken, and they talk about even back in megalithic uh, Scotland and Britain, uh, in Ireland, like it's 3200 BC, and the average life ex expectancy is like 25 years old, and one in ten women die in childbirth. But they've amassed this incredible effort to to make generationally make like new grange and these other sites, and and how do you organize that? know all the science and convince the population that it's worthwhile it's it's it, it's the thing we're talking about it's not like they're getting whipped or something like that or just like the pyramids it wasn't a slave uh endeavor it was orchestrated by you know thoth this this magical genius you know and to produce this tool this machine of enlightenment you know if you've been to the great pyramid in the king's chamber I could see why people think it was built by aliens. It's like an alien machine. It is absolutely crazy. And it's, mm -hmm. um, and Casey, Edgar Casey, once again, he says it was an initiation chamber that Jesus actually went into 2000 years ago as well. But you would go in there and you would lay in the empty coffin, which he said is the overcoming of death is the realization of the false nature of the, the shadow world, you know? So <laughs> it's so great, Jesus, man. Jesus was in there. Jesus was in That's what Casey says. All right, okay. That's so great. Hey, Jesus, you know, a couple masters shared that coffin. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit further, Jim, but I also want to let you off the hook. I know it's late there, and uh, I can tell he's fading a little bit in his eyes. And I yeah, I can know. tell too. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I, I, I appreciate your kind words. That's that's great. Uh, no worries. Yeah. Um, basically, I'll I'll let Jim take over here. Um, thanks for having me on for this this part of the um, show, and uh, I'll catch you soon, Robert. Okay. Thank, you yeah, take, I'll absolutely. Take, I'll take the pilot seat here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Hugh. Okay. Yeah. Before we cut it off, Hugh. Uh, I mean, uh, Jim, yeah. that that just bringing up Jesus um, brought me back to a topic when I was in Japan, in the northern part of uh, Japan, up in a place called Amori, A-M-O-R-I. They have a place that they claim uh, that Jesus was buried, that he finished his years there, and that he was training with Japanese masters. Um, before he went over to the Middle East to share what he learned there. And that along the way, he also trained with sages in India. And of course, there's a place in India that also claims that he's buried in India. Yep. But have you ever heard of the story of him being buried in Japan? Uh, no, I, I've heard the India story, but I've also... Um... I study Gary Renard's books. I don't know if you're familiar, Disappearance of the Universe. No. He's a non-dualist who studies The Course in Miracles, which is this metaphysical document. It's like the Advaita Vedanta, the teachings of Lao Tzu, Buddha, uh, Plato, Jesus, Mary Magdalene. They're all, you know, like Plato's cave. This is a secondary manifestation, a shadow world to awaken from, that, that kind of stuff. But Gary has ascended masters that teach him, and they tell these kind of interesting historical stories interspersed with metaphysical truths and one of the things they said was jesus definitely traveled extensively uh in the years that you know 
he was missing. And that yeah. Mary Magdalene was an enlightened master as well, which we now know, if we, you know from the uh, Nag Hammadi scrolls found in 1947. And Buddha was not off Philip in the Bible. And then Gary writes a book about the incarnations of Jesus and Buddha, uh, where they incarnate like 40 different times together, which is really interesting. They go through seven lives where they were students in Plato's Academy. They were both in love with Mary Magdalene as Shinto's in Japan. It's really fascinating how they became enlightened, how they learned non-dualism and basically left the matrix. But Jesus was supposed to have, she had wisdom. He was, he taught the seven sages when he was like eight years old. and. Uh, he didn't need to come back, meaning that he was on the he was enlightened already, but he came back to kind of share that message where <clears throat> I think a lot of us are in these lifetimes where there's a lot of difficulty and indifference and self reflection you know like Eckhart Tolle wakes up on a bench one day and he's you know looking into space for six months, but that doesn't happen without a lot of groundwork first, so some people can't understand you know. Oh, how can a master be like that? But it's just a developmental thing. But anyways, to the to your point, I, I firmly believe he traveled around uh, many places, maybe South America. And I think he materialized, frankly. I think he was like Neo in the Matrix, and he could. In fact, his teachers say that Jesus and Mary transported to Stonehenge at one point, too, because this was a, a, a tool of enlightenment as well, which is funny. Yeah, well, after studying Christianity and theology for five years, uh, that that was that was my conclusion. There's, you know, again on the ac academics and intellectual side, there's a lot to be desired. But uh, my conclusion was that we're supposed to imitate him. We're supposed to mimic whatever he's doing to the best of our ability, and then we will be able to have those neo-like. Uh, uh, abilities ourselves and then we won't be so miserable here on planet earth it, it's so true it's it's uh and he was like an eastern mystic when you really read read into yeah. his stuff just yeah. like buddha but the thing i love about non-dualism is the simple message there's one mind basically broken into all these different aspects and movie characters you know you get the light of the one inhabiting temporarily this body that has gone to sleep like the prodigal sons and daughters we left heaven to have this kind of weird thought experiment, which, you know, you can judge it however you want, but the moral of the story is you want to awaken to what you really are, whether you're here or you're not. And that means that every judgment you have, every thought you have is all aimed back to your subconscious mind, your only mind, the only mind. So, right. So like out in the screen, oh, this politician or this person, whoever you judge, you subconsciously tell it about yourself. And, and that's the simple message right there. If, if, and you're like, well, what about this guy? He's screwing up the world. What about global warming? You know, it's all this looking at the movie screen that we created and judging it. It goes back to the message. Like if I forgive you, I subconsciously forgive myself for any weird or embarrassing things I've done. And, and that's the whole message. That's why forgiveness is, that's what the Course in Miracles is about. It's not a phony worldly forgiveness. It's like, Forgive yourself for dreaming an erroneous dream that has nothing to do with your real self. And that simple message, you're right. That's what Jesus was saying. He's like, the wor this world is a false world. You're all sons and daughters of God. I'm not special. Yeah. I'm showing you, I'm a wisdom teacher, and you're showing you how to get the hell out of here. I'm not coming here to fix all the problems in the world because it's a false secondary world. Where, what does it even mean to fix the problems? Like, oh, we, we got free energy and food, and oh, now there's 28 billion. Oh, here's another commentary disaster. It never ends in the matrix. It's like you, you want to awaken and leave uh, this place. <laughs> Not it's, to bum anybody out, but it's a good message at the end, you know? <laughs> it's like a roller coaster, you know? Whoa, whoa. And, and all you got to do is get a grip that you're just on a roller coaster. Okay, now this feeling. <laughs> okay, now this feeling. Okay, now this feeling. And, and non-reactive you know, to the screen of the world. That's yeah. the key. Yeah. Yeah. And all the ancient traditions that I've uh, studied, and even as long as I studied theology, you know, I, I ended up with more questions than answers. I was like, okay, I still don't have the answers that I, I feel like I need to. What's my purpose here on life? Why am I here? Where is this all going? Where is this leading to? 
And uh, having to study, you know, the ancient civilization as part of my theology studies got me interested in all this ancient civilization and cultures. And I still believe the answers for our future are somewhere in the past, and it's just been overlooked and left behind. Certainly, and they're within the holographic mind as well. They're they're intuitively known by the collective unconscious, <laughs> and that, that's why this is important. It's not like, oh, that temple priest, uh, I hope we can find his records and then figure out what the hell's going on here. <laughs> like we just talked about, the mind is creating the secondary manifestation, so it's you. it's done at the level of the mind. I don't like, I'm not against anybody doing anything in the world, but you know, there's people at the peace rally hitting other people over the head with the sign, you know, it's just like, you know what I'm saying? That it's Hello. done at the level of the mind through forgiveness and not a corny ass phony forgiveness, like a new age gooey thing. It's, it's like a real, um, for, forgiving yourself for over identifying with a secondary manifestation essentially, because believe me in, in other lifetimes, you think we were saints, you know what I mean? We were murderers and lunatics, and right? How many wars have we been in and cutting off heads and getting tortured? It's like ridiculous. It's like a bad movie. So you forgive all the movie characters as, as like a, a temporary hallucination. You yeah. don't like make it real, like, oh my God, this, this, this guy's doing this. And oh, what about the Senate needs to impeach Trump or Hillary and uranium? You know, like it never ends. And everybody's preferences are weaponized by the internet now so if you're yeah. left or right you read one article right 10 minutes later it's like aoc is eating your kids you know you're reading that article or or trump likes getting you know <laughs> this done to him by ukrainian prostitutes it just never ends and and it's all about vengeance and entertainment through through like turning the screws on people you know yeah. what i'm saying i mean yeah. you know this but yeah that, i try to like i hate the internet i don't have a phone I mean, I like it for research and cool stuff, but all the dark side of it is just lame, like politics, you know, all those back and forths. And that, you never change anybody's opinion. You know, it's more like, sh oh, I like to share this information maybe. But the back and forth is all about uh, just just turning the screws and vengeance and, uh, and it all comes back to you. And, pe and people are oriented like that. They're always miserable because they're, they're depressing themselves with their thoughts. You know, they're not liberating themselves like, ah. Oh, it doesn't matter who's president because we're, it's a reflection of a mind. And it will only make sense uh, when we see somebody who represents a healed mind out there. You know, mm -hmm. it's not going to be done by, you know, having the Supreme Court vote on something. It's all, you know what I mean? It's like going up to the movie screen and trying to like change the, the figures around. It doesn't work. <laughs> the projector has to be fixed, right? <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite uh, scriptures that I kept for myself um, I think it's in Romans. I, I don't have it memorized, uh, the, the uh, verse and, and text, but uh, I remember it said, do not judge for as you judge, you shall also be judged. And how I deducted that, the, the meaning from that for me was every judgment that I make against someone else, I'm not making it against them actually. I'm making it against myself. Until I get that, I'm going to keep you know, skipping on that part of the record until I get the lesson. That's a great observation. That's an enlightened way to see it because it's exactly that. It's a holographic message. It's not, there's a weird bearded white guy in the throne that's like pissed off half the time. And if I'm good, I'll eat ice cream with them for eternity and where half my friends will be in hell. It's just like, does that make sense? No, it's, it's reality is abstract and formless. The concrete and specific of the false world makes you think and interpret that God is like a, a man. You know, that's Old Testament, fearful, you know, mind control. But you're absolutely right. It, it, it's, it's all done at the level of the mind. Uh, the, the uh, you know, understanding what judgment is all about. <clears throat> that's cool. That, that is a great um, passage. Well, the other thing that caught my mind earlier when you said about the pyramids and, and talking about the situation of the slaves and thinking of you as a stonemason, because uh, I didn't get involved in the stones, but I got involved in mosaics. And I just loved the geometry, figuring, figuring it out, um, the visualizing it. And 
I don't, I don't see slaves building these places. Like you said earlier, and that's the first time I had heard that, um, and you and you were mentioning that these actually are places of compassion that are being passed on to the next generation. I never really thought of it that way as, um, you know, this is information they're trying to give us so we can survive the harshness of this world and properly inform us so that we don't have to keep skipping on that record. <clears throat> and it, it's not even written documents. You see, we've, we've done our best to destroy all records of the past. It's that people show up at these sites and it's intuitively revealed to them, right? Mm -hmm. By within time and space using specific, you know, um, divine mathematics and geometry to elicit that understanding within the individual. Not, oh, I went to the Mayan temple and I read all this stuff and it made perfect sense. It's like, I viscerally experienced something larger. Whoa, you know, and these devices are all around the planet. And, and that, that's the nature of it. It's supposed to elicit the response in the individual, not convey something externally in a written form or, or a teaching like that. So, because once you have these experiences of something uh, divine and larger, you never go back. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But you could stay stuck in like I was an atheist for a long time because I'm a recovering Catholic, you know. I grew up in Boston, as you <laughs> might be able to tell, and you know, it was a freak show. And um, you know, the moral of the story is that I just I was compelled to uh get on this path by my experiences that I couldn't get away from. So it was in, you know, I was already programmed to go in this direction. But no question, these ancient sites, you know, like some of the the Masons were the, the mystics, uh, the, the builders of Temple of Solomon. They un understood. They weren't just like, you know, rough wire in a house like an electrician. It was like the Masons understood the geometry, the, the symbolism, the mathematics, the metaphysical uh, implications of what they were doing. So it was a craft that was the blend of the two. And I know from working with stone, it's like every stone wants to go somewhere. It's yeah. re remarkable. The stone wants to go here. And sometimes I'll put it in the wrong place and it'll pinch me, you know, and I'll lose a thumbnail or something. And, and they want to be displayed. Even if they're the middle of the wall and people can't see them, the stones want to be part of a structure that uh, enchants the landscape. It's really fascinating working with stone. And it's like this mystical medium to work with. But there's also mathematics and geometry involved in, in sacred uh, intent. So... Uh, frankly, once again, uh, an academic indoctrinated into an atheistic cult can't see these sites for what they are. It's just like, oh, okay, oh, that slope angle, that's interesting. Maybe it was oriented to the sun. Oh, they, they did this for that. Oh, here's a drainage system. It's just lost on them. And that, that's not to denigrate anyone. Like I said, it's just um, the over-specialization in all the fields we're talking about uh, do a disservice to the reality of what's going on because a holistic orientation is what opens you up to this, like, oh, now I see it. But you'll never see it from a limited perspective. And, and that's, that's my criticism of the academic side of these arguments. <clears throat> my criticism of the other side is there's a lot of true believers and there's a lot of bullshit on the internet. And there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of phony, like new age, uh, not new age, like alternative um, researchers. I'm not dissing anybody. I'm just saying kind of in it for the money, don't really do their homework too well. Their facts always screwed up. There's a lot of passing around of fake claims between all these books. And then I'll like go to the museum and find that <clears throat> it's completely wrong. Or I'll talk to an anthropologist, you know, oh, there's an elongated skull here or six fingers and toes on the statue. And, so there's a lot of wishful thinking and phony legends and stuff like that, that I'm not, you know, I'm just saying, do your homework and understand there's no peer review in the ancient mysteries field. So, you know, a lot of, you know, Freddie Silver and Andrew Collins, Hugh and Hancock, Baval, Robert Schock, Greg Little, uh, Brian Forrester. There's a lot of people that I know very well that um, really, uh, Robert Temple, I must add, like very bright oriented correctly and we don't all agree on believe me we we believe we we agree on general themes but we're at odds on other ideas which is fine the point is that it's an open-minded group of people really investigating this you know and hancock just you see his new book how much you know they're, they're just coming after him and it's not like 
I mean, I'm out there, believe me. He's like conservative compared to me, you know what I mean? And, and the academics, they're all over him, man. They can't stand it. And that's the thing that this information wasn't out there in the 70s or the 80s, as we know, like a couple books here and there. But now when you see a presentation by someone, when you see all the documents, when you see all the oral traditions, now it's like, I think over half the population believes in Atlantis and believes in extraterrestrials now. And the skeptical say it's because like all these mind rot, you know, TV shows that are like promising all this, this false stuff. And I'm like, no, it's because the uh, material is now open uh, to evaluate for yourself. And it's just like, oh my God, I can't believe all those coincidences or that makes perfect sense. Or there's this whole surge of understanding that there are megalithic sites around the world that are beyond the capabilities of the people at the time. So, you know, all these ideas, I think, have uh, opened people up to new understandings. The other thing that, that caught my attention was when, when you were saying about the passion of the builders and the masons, it, it, it suddenly clicked for me. That makes so much more sense because it's a lot easier to motivate people when they're passionate or they know it's for their own good than it is to force them to do things that they don't want to do. Totally. The two million stones in the construction, the Great Pyramid, to get that level of precision, you have, you have to be fired up about what you're doing. And there has to be a really compelling reason. It can't be just like a tomb for some whacked out king, you know? <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. And you're right. And it would never come out as good and as highly technical if that were the case, if you're just getting whipped all day. And th that's just like an um, archaic way of viewing these things. And I, I think. Science has been predominantly wrong about so much. I can't uh, uh, think of a major theory, whether it be Clovis Barrier out of Africa, um, you know, Neanderthals not being able to mate with humans that has been overturned, you know, in the last 50 years or something like that. And I think it's very healthy to look and say, what else do we have wrong? It's basically archaeology and geology and anthropology are built off the Victorian ideas of a bunch of specialists in the 1800s and then in the early 1900s more there were really racist ideas too there were some hardcore racists who ran the Smithsonian and other institutions and you know it was pre-Nazi eugenic skull measurement and stuff like that and denigrating Native American African American races as you know uh, in fairy and all that garbage and now of course you know Academics are much more progressive, but I'm saying back then, a lot of the theories, I mean, Darwin said these horribly racist things about uh, indigenous peoples. And, you know, they were basically a bunch of racist assholes who created the Western idea of archaeology and anthropology. And then there was these mild changes, and it's like, okay, we can't view things like that. And it evolved into what we have today, which I think is just a real half-assed version of, of, um, of reality and, and doesn't does a disservice to all these ancient cultures and it's not personal it's if you're involved in any aspect of modern society you know if you work at the post office you're in government you're you're involved in an institution that you you know is just doesn't have its shit together that so it's not you know what i'm saying well yeah. like I'm, I'm not trying to badmouth anyone i'm just saying if you're involved in the church you, you're involved in an organization that's pretty screwed up at this point you know if you're involved in government or anthropology you're involved in a, in a weird and dogmatic place that doesn't really encourage free thinking that's in science in i'm sorry in, in medicine especially like this neuroscientist from harvard a couple of years ago he came back from a near-death experience he was like oh my god he's on the cover of newsweek and he got just like buried by all his colleagues like he's a lunatic and I thought like, whoa, they're going to pay attention because he's one of them. It's like he's no longer one of them, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So my goal here isn't to cast dispersions on anyone. It's just to point out the only way to get the job done is to completely liberate yourself and be a free thinker uh, when it comes to any topic. And the Buddha would say, never trust what I say. Always test it out yourself. Don't have blind faith in anything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Jim. I really appreciate that because I think the metaphysical component, I started out with a metaphysical component because I was trying to think, uh, you know, explain things that I couldn't explain. Um, 
but when I found out there were issues with it, I didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I just started using the research techniques that I knew and, and had obtained and started looking in other places. So I think it's really important to bring that spiritual aspect into it. Otherwise, I, I don't know what the point would be. What, what's know? the point? Yeah. It, it, what's the point of anything, really? Because you're not, you're not correctly analyzing the nature of time and space. You apparently have this limited amount of time. And then even if you reincarnate, you come back and it's just like I'm another weird configuration. Like, what's going on? It doesn't get to the root of the problem. Trillions yeah. of souls have passed through this shadow world and nobody makes it out alive. You think that's worth contemplating? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'm just going to watch the Super Bowl and get drunk, you know. And I, it's just like, I think it's worth paying attention to, you know. Yeah. And that's where I'm coming from. It's just like, <laughs> these are important questions. Not because it's so deadly serious, but it's just like, yeah, of course I want to figure out what the hell is going on and, and increase my odds of, of like waking up from a delusion or hallucination, of course. Mm -hmm. And I, I think these are pathways, these metaphysical pursuits are just that. And um, I think it's cool. I'm glad you're open-minded to these ideas because this is the tough stuff that people don't want to hear. They yeah. want like, you're my spiritual teacher. You know, you're supposed to help me get more stuff and fake like law of abundance. And I live in a castle and you're still going to die. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not going to stop all the, the, the things you got to deal with in the matrix. It's like, how do you, how do you analyze and, and um, basically metabolize these truths into some level of understanding? Like law of abundance is great, but it's not getting you basically back to heaven, if you will. Yeah. In fact, it affixes you to the false world a lot. Like what's the next hit? When's the UPS truck going to show up? My <laughs> levels of dopamine are low. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'm, I, I'm also pleasantly surprised, you know, because we haven't had a conversation before. So uh, this is my first time meeting you. And uh, for to have this component, I was already impressed with other components of what you've been presenting. So thank you. I, I yeah, think I, this I, is I one think of the most important. It, it is. And I'm, my brother and I are on the same page. We've seen a spiritual enlightened teacher for like 20 years. We do a bunch of shows for History Channel and other places. And I think we just try to display that, you know, we're a couple of blue collar idiots, but we understand. I think we can, a lot of um, people can relate. We don't come across in this, in this way, like enlightenment isn't what you think. I used to yeah. think I'd have to emulate the Dalai Lama and I can't like, you know, want all this stuff and I have to meditate all day. And it's just like, that's not me. I have a different orientation this time around. And, but that doesn't mean I can't like forgive things in my mind or not be an asshole. You know, like <laughs> there are ways to orient yourself correctly, but not try to emulate somebody as some false version of what enlightenment or spirituality looks like. So hopefully that comes through. Cause that's, you know, what I try to convey is just like, uh, you know, this, my experience is that this works essentially. Awesome. Well, I know it's getting late there for you guys. And um, uh, one more thing. I, I just wanted to, I was curious, have you been to Chaco? I imagine you have. Have you been to Chaco before? No, I haven't. I try to get there once and I, yeah, I know, which is great. Uh, I'm going to talk about it in my talk. And it's great that we're going to those sites because that's exactly what's going on. Gary, David, too. You got a great lineup, by the way. That's not to dis, like that's, your lineup is better like than contact in the desert or any, you know what I mean? I think you really nailed uh, the speakers. Martin Thank Gray, I, I've never met him, but I said, I know that dude is spiritually oriented because he can't not be because he went to all these sites. Yeah. You know, he's like this mainstream uh, Nat Geo guy at first, and I'm sure he's gone like turned inside out by all these ancient sites. So uh, I think it's great that you're doing it and doing the tour after and, and tools of enlightenment. That's what we were talking about. So. Bring the peyote. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding, interweb. <laughs> yeah. Wow. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Jim. I really enjoyed it. I know you guys got a lot going on there, and, and uh, it's late there in the UK. So 
Yeah, yeah, no, great to connect. I'm glad we're on the same page. It's really, it's nice to meet you finally, and I'm sure we'll be fast friends. Yes, me too. And it's going to be so much fun to have you here for a week, and then we get to go on a tour too. Wow. That's cool. I'm not letting anything stop me from doing this tour. I'm, I'm really looking so forward to this. Excellent. Nice. All right, brother. You okay. be well. You as well. Thank you so much, Jim. All right. All right. Have See you later, Robert. Yeah, take care.